Welcome to our next lesson in Greek Grammar 2. This is second semester Greek Grammar. And in this lesson, we're going to be learning about participles, a very important chapter and lesson. And in particular, we're going to be learning about present tense participles and future tense participles. So buckle your seatbelts, here we go. Now, before we begin looking at the participles for this lesson, Let's review our vocabulary list, first of all, found in our textbook by Ray Summers. This is chapter 20. And beginning at the top, we have a term that you're going to need for your um, translations of 1 John when we get to the epistle of 1 John in a few chapters. And it's the term here, adikia, and it's feminine, as you can see by the article he, and it's the term for unrighteousness. And this is related to the family of terms uh, that also deal with righteousness. You've learned in a previous lesson that the term dikaios is the term for righteous or righteous one. And that's related to the verb form dikaio, which means to declare righteous. It's the term for justification or to justify. And so hey adakia is, is used in 1 John 1 verse 9, where it says, if we are if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all adikia. The next word on the list is a very important theological term in the New Testament. It's the word for resurrection, anastasis. And also in its uh, genitive form, you'll see the second form listed right after it, after the comma there, anastaseos. Hey, anastaseos. And sometimes, again, with uh, words that are um, third declension especially, you will see uh, both the nominative and genitive case forms listed for you. The next word on the list is day, meaning it is necessary. This is used as a verb, sometimes a, an infinitive, uh, sometimes in its participle form, deon. And the word is very common, especially in Luke's writings in the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. The next word down is the term for the devil, ha diabolos. And then after that is the term for mercy, ta elaas and ta eleus, again in the genitive form. And the word after that is heos, heos. Notice the rough breathing there. That's the term for until or while. And then we have a name listed here, the name for Mary. It has two forms in which it's spelled in the New Testament, Maria and Mariam. And um, you'll notice as well that it has a uh, article before it. And many times when you're reading the Greek New Testament, you'll see that proper names have an article before them, unlike our practice in English. It seems strange to us, but that's actually quite common. In fact, the norm as you read the New Testament. Now, there's two forms of her name listed here, and that's just simply because this is a, a word that's indeclinable. Usually proper names don't have the full range of case uh, spellings. They just have one or two forms in which they occur. Now, the last word on the list is the word hotten, and that's the uh, word for when or whenever. Continuing on our vocabulary list, uh, the next word on the list is aphelo, which is a verb, and it means I owe or I ought. And after that is the word for I, like your physical I, ha ephthalmos. And of course, when you speak of going to the ophthalmologist, you're going to the eye doctor. And so it's easy to remember that term. And then after that is the term for um, being an advocate. This is a term that's used for the Holy Spirit in the scriptures to describe him as the helper or the advocate, ha parakletas. And you'll notice the preposition para, where we get parallel from, and think of the Holy Spirit as the one who comes alongside of, as the helper, one who's called alongside of. The kletas in the compound word there refers to calling. And literally the Holy Spirit is one who's called alongside of, to uplift us, enable us, and dwell us and point us to Jesus Christ and enable us for service. So hara para, ha parakletas. The next word is pos. It's the word how. Um, this is a very common word 
And so it's easy to remember, pos. The next word is scandalon, and it's neuter. And this refers to an offense or a stumbling block, as it's sometimes translated. And again, another very common word in the New Testament. The next word is phos or photas. Again, it's neuter with the article ta. And you see both spellings there for the nominative and genitive case. And this is the word for light. Of course, just think of photo, photosynthesis, and so forth. The next word is pseudomai, and this is a verb. And you'll notice that it's deponent, and this is the term that means I lie or I deceive. And related to that is the noun form uh, below it, um, sustes, ha sustes, and that's the term for a liar. And that's it for our vocabulary words for this lesson. Now let's shift to the new part of grammar or speech that we're going to be looking at for this lesson, and that is participles. And this is a very important chapter and subject, as you'll see as we go along. But before we start talking about Greek participles, let's just review for a moment our English participles. You will recall that in English, participles are verbs, in essence, that have an ing ending attached to it, uh, but no subject, and they can modify nouns. In other words, they have an adjectival function, or they can modify verbs. They have an adverbial function. And just a couple examples here for you. And I want to just show you a couple examples of participles in English to show you their function. First of all, starting with the sentence, the football lying on the field is deflated and needs air. Uh, to lie is normally, to lie like on the ground, is normally a verb, but here it's put in the participle form with the ing ending. And you'll notice that it's modifying what word? The word football. It tells us something more about the football. And thus it has an adjectival function. And in this next, next example, you'll see that the participle has more of an adverbial function. Jumping to his feet, he hurtled the large boulder. And of course, jumping is um, simultaneous with hurtled, and so it's modifying the verb there. And so I want you just to see that even in English, uh, adject or excuse me, um, participles have both an adjectival and an adverbial function. And this is similar to how uh, participles are used also in Greek, uh, because Greek participles are part verb and part adjective. They are extremely versatile, in fact, more versatile, it seems, in Greek than even in English. And they can function in various ways, such as as a verb, though this is more of the, the rare occurrence. They can be imperatival verbs, a command. They can be used as indicative verbs. And of course, they can function as the subject of a sentence or a clause. They can be the direct object, the indirect object, the object of a preposition. They can serve as the predicate nominative. And of course, we've already seen they can be used adjectivally and adverbially. Those are the two main ways. And so I want you to see that in essence, the participle in Greek is like the Swiss army knife of all forms or parts of speech. Because of the complexity and the uh, flexibility and the common usage of participles, it's no wonder that uh, Greek grammarian Daniel Wallace has stated in his um, excellent grammar book, Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, that mastery of the syntax of participles is mastery of Greek syntax. And you'll understand why as we go along. He's saying in essence that if you can understand participles in Greek, you can understand anything in the Greek language. Participles are very frequent in Greek. You'll notice in the New Testament that they occur about every 1.2 verses. In other words, a little more than one, uh, they're not one per verse per se, but a little less frequent than one per verse. 662 participles in the New Testament. I've seen some other statistics that say the figure's slightly lower than that. It depends on uh, textual variants and manuscript differences, that sort of thing. But the New Testament has 7,958 verses in it. And when you add up all the participles, you can see 
that they're quite common and therefore very important. Now I mentioned already that verb uh, participles are verbal adjectives. They are hybrids in essence. They are like verbs and they're like adjectives and you put them together. I should clarify that participles and infinitives in Greek are not verbs. They are not finite verbs. They are what's called a verbal part of speech, their own separate category from verbs. Uh, participles like infinitives are non-finite verbs and sometimes they're called verbals rather than verbs. And of course, as you think of an infinitive, you think of a non-finite verb. Uh, but technically the phrase that best describes participles is verbal adjectives. And they are hybrids in that sense, part verb, part adjective, or at least they have the characteristics of both without being either a verb or an adjective. And some people who are intimidated by participles look at them as a hybrid, like we speak of a part human, part machine or something, a hybrid or part human, part animal, like a monstrosity of some sort. Don't think of participles that way. They're not that intimidating. Uh, think of them as being like a verb in the sense that they have tense and they have voice. They will occur in four tense forms in the New Testament, present, future, aorist, and perfect. Uh, in other words, some tense forms are not used. The participle just doesn't occur in the Greek language in those forms, but they do occur in those four, present, future, aorist, and perfect. Likewise, they occur in all the voice forms. So there'll be active voice, middle voice, passive voice. Uh, they are capable of all three voices. Now when it comes to their characteristics of being like an adjective, they have case, gender, and number. You'll find that uh, they occur in the normal case uh, forms that you already know to this point, nominative case, or genitive case, or dative case, or accusative case, if you're following the five case system. They'll also, um, uh, uh, they will not occur in the vocative case, uh, which is the form of address again that we've studied, but uh, it's very uh, rare, uh, more rare in terms of that case form appearing in the New Testament. Um, the vocative case is used 14 times adjectivally in the New Testament, and it's used five times substantively in the New Testament. And those are characteristics of adjectival uh, participle use as we're going to see in this lesson. But in essence, you can just cross out the vocative case for participles. They, they do not occur in that case form. They only occur in the other case forms I mentioned, nominative, genitive, dative, accusative. They also have gender. You will find participles that are masculine, feminine, and neuter, all three genders used. They also have uh, both numbers, singular and plural used. One other significant thing to note about participles is that they don't have person like verbs do. In other words, they don't occur in the first, second, or third person so that you don't know whether it's uh, the subject of the verb who's doing the acting is I or you or he, she, or it, or they, that sort of thing. Um, you'll recall when it comes to verbs that verbs have the subject built right into the verb. And so if you just have one word in Greek, a verb, you have both the subject and the, the verb itself, the action. And one single verb can form an entire independent clause or sentence in Greek. Um, the, just looking at the verb that has person, therefore you know who is doing the acting. Well, that isn't true when it comes to participles in Greek. Because they don't have grammatical person, you have to rely on the broader context to know who is doing the action reflected in the underlying verb of the participle. And so participles being non-finite forms like infinitives also, they simply describe an action without telling us necessarily who did the action. You need context to tell, tell you that. And so you'll note the absence of person when it comes to our study of participles. Now, as you look at a participle, as it's used in a sentence, you'll see that it has 
uh, number, even though it doesn't have person. So it's either singular or plural. And oftentimes that helps you look for a singular actor or subject in the sentence or a plural actor or subjects in the sentence. And you'll see uh, what it's modifying or goes with. And another very important thing to note about participles is that they share the same aspect as verb tenses. They are aspect prominent, just like uh, verbs were that we saw in the indicative mood, that the time of action is secondary to the perspective of the action from the writer or speaker's standpoint. So when you think of participles, it's easy to ask ourselves, first of all, when did this occur? And secondly, what kind of action was it? And lastly, what was the point of view of the writer or speaker? Well, we need to um, put aspect first in our thinking when it comes to participles, just like we did with verbs. Greek, again, is a aspect prominent language, and that applies to participles as well. And that's why I put back up here the uh, forms for you, the tense forms in which Participles uh, occur, present, future, aorist. Now I left off perfect tense form because that's going to be covered in a future lesson when we get to perfect indicative tense forms, which we haven't even looked at as one of our other indicative forms yet. But once we look at the perfect indicative, then we'll look at perfect participles as well. And I'll add that to the uh, box of options here for you. But again, just by way of review, when you see present tense form, whether it's for uh, an indicative mood verb or, or participle um, or even non-indicative uh, verbs in the subjunctive mood or imperative mood, the aspect remains the same for all of them uh, based on tense form. So whenever you see present tense form, whether it's indicative mood verb, subjunctive, imperative, or participle, um, you should be thinking to yourself an imperfective aspect, which again puts us proximate to the action. We see the action unfolding right before our eyes. It's an internal viewpoint of the action. And then, of course, with the aorist tense form, we have the opposite, perfective aspect that views the action more remotely, that sees it as a whole um, or in summary form. And so there's your contrast. In terms of morphology of participles, you should know their component parts. They, in essence, have four main parts to them uh, from their verb parent, so to speak. And I put quotes around parent there, just in your thinking. In other words, what the verb contributes to the participle form is the verb stem. And you'll notice lu from our common verb that we've been studying to this point, uh, luo. So you'll see they have a, a verb stem. There's also a connecting vowel, just like verbs have. But then there's going to be a participle sign or marker or indicator. Some people call it an infix um, or a morpheme. Sometimes all four terms are used. But regardless, you'll notice that there's the new tau combination there. That is your participle marker or sign. And then, of course, you've got case endings, which are contributed by the adjective parent to the hybrid participle. And the case endings are ones that you've already learned so far, so uh, you won't have anything new to learn there. And here we have the word luantas, which is the genitive singular masculine form for the present active participle. Uh, genitive form is often used uh, with illustrations in learning Greek uh, for purposes of illustration like we have here because the genitive case is more regular in terms of how it's declined than the nominative case. And so that's why you've got the genitive masculine form here. And here we have the same word except it is now in the... Um, a feminine form, so it's still present active in terms of its tense and voice. Uh, in terms of case, it's still genitive. In terms of number, it's still singular, but what's changed is the gender. And so now instead of masculine, it's feminine, but notice how the word changes to luuses. 
And again, you've got the stem, you've got the connecting vowel, you've got the case ending in the genitive form. And what's changed is your participle sign or marker for the feminine with the upsilon and the sigma there instead of the new tau for the masculine. And here we have our paradigm for the present active participles using the uh, root word luo. And so you can see, again, they have three different genders in which they occur. And on the left column, you'll see the uh, singular. And on the right column, you'll see uh, the plural forms. And all four cases are used there, starting with the nominative case, luon, and then the genitive case, luantas, and then the dative case, luanti, and the accusative, luanta. I'm looking at the masculine singular column. The masculine plural, luantes, and luanton, luusen, and luantas. And then, of course, you've got your feminine and your neuter forms as well. Now, since each of these forms is capable of um, a wide variety of usage, um, I have not provided a translation next to each of these words, or gloss, as it's sometimes called, which is a, which is a short uh, equivalent where you attach uh, what normally would be the translation, but participles are used in such a variety of ways that I can't put a single word up there next to each case form here that you're looking at to show you how it should be translated or interpreted. Um, I will try to give you a few verses as we go along with these examples just so you see how um, some of these participle forms can be translated but that's the reason why I, I didn't put anything up here in this case like we did with verbs. Furthermore, it wouldn't fit because uh, obviously you've got a lot more forms now for this paradigm. But again, notice as you're looking at uh, this paradigm, you'll see the lu stem, root, um, um, verb stem there. You'll see the participle sign or marker there of, of uh, nu tau with the connecting vowel omicron for the masculine. And uh, you'll also see third declension endings for the masculine. When you switch to the feminine columns, you'll see that they use first declension uh, noun endings. And then as you go to the neuter, you'll see that they use uh, second declension endings. And again, you've learned all these to this point, so there's nothing new there. But one thing <clears throat> to note is uh, the difference in these signs or infixes there between the masculine and the <clears throat> feminine, or I should say masculine neuter, they share the same participle marker. And you'll see the difference with the upsilon sigma for the feminine. And for this slide, what I've done is simply highlighted in light blue there, the um, stem from the verb luo uh, with lu. And I did that in order for you to see the connecting vowels, the, the participle marker, and the case endings. And so if you take off the verb stem lu, notice in the next slide what we're left with, we're left with the um, participle forms for a, me. Remember, I am. So here's the uh, declension <clears throat> for the participle form of a, me. It's the same as the present active participle forms, um, just minus that verb stem, lu, that we saw on the previous slide. And by the way, you'll notice that I said declension. Here's the declension for a, me, participles. Remember that when we speak of verb forms, we say conjugations. Uh, verbs are conjugated, nouns and adjectives and so forth are declined, or they have a declension. And so there's a distinction to be noted there in our terminology. Now, there's one other important thing to note here uh, before we leave this slide, uh, namely that these are all participle forms of a me. Remember that the word a me itself is technically the present indicative form. And there are also imperfect and future tense forms of a me, which we've learned to this point. Um, but with the participle forms of a, me, they do not exist in 
future aorist perfect tense forms, they only have this present form for Amy verbs. And so you only have one set of participle forms for masculine, feminine, and neuter, and they're all right here. You're looking at them. And so fortunately, you don't have to learn different tense forms for participle forms of Amy. Just use the present tense throughout. Now here we have an example of the uh, participle form in John 9 verse 25 which says then he answered if he is a sinner I do not know one thing I do know that being blind i.e. before now I see the uh, blind man who was healed by Jesus says so we have the own uh, participle there and that is the uh, masculine singular nominative form of the participle a me and here it's translated or should be translated being in other words being blind whereas before that to floss i was uh, blind being blind now i see he says and so it's translated in present time because the context is present here i am You'll want to translate when the context is present time with the words am, is, are, or being, as I did here for this verse. Um, so it's present in tense form, but it's capable of being used in other time tenses as well. Like uh, if it's past time, for example, if you have a verb in the context or the sentence that is aorist indicative, when you come across one of these uh, participles for a me instead of translating it as am is are being present tense concepts you'll want to switch and supply in your translation the word was or were and so the participle form of a me is very flexible in terms of the times or tenses in which it can be used and you should translate it accordingly so we've seen already the present active participle forms of luo. Now here on this slide, we're going to see the paradigm for uh, present middle and passive participle forms. Again, all three genders represented there. And I know it looks like a lot of paradigms to memorize or learn, but again, it's not that complicated when you stop and look at each participle here and break it down in terms of its constituent parts. Again, you've got the uh, root there, stem, uh, from luo, the root word. You've got the stem, lu, and then you've got a connecting vowel, the omicron, and then you've got the uh, participle sign for middle and passive here of the uh, word men, uh, mu, epsilon, nu, and then you've got your case endings, which you've already learned to this point. Um, in fact, for the masculine columns there, you'll see that they're simply second declension noun endings as well as for the neuter. And then when you look at the feminine columns, you'll see that the case endings there are simply first declension. So you've got a, a two, one, two pattern as far as declension endings for masculine, feminine, and neuter. Now, in order to help you see again these constituent parts, I'm going to contrast this slide with the next one where the root uh, word the stem out rather is lu and that's highlighted in light blue so notice again here when you subtract the stem lu what are you left with you're left with an omicron connecting vowel the uh, participle marker or sign of uh, mu epsilon nu men and then you've just got your case endings which you already know and so it's rather easy to identify when you look at its parts that way now here's an example of how to translate a passive participle, present passive participle. And in this case, I'm using Mark 1, verse 13, where it says that Jesus was there in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. So he was in the wilderness. You see the word ain. That tells us it's an ame verb in the imperfect form. Um, third person he was there in the wilderness in the desert and what was he what was happening with him uh, he was being tempted it says 
Uh, the verb form perazo is now in the um, perfect passive participle form perazamanas and being tempted by Satan, it says. And so when you translate a passive participle, you'll simply want to supply the word being. Now you could, I suppose, translate it this way, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. But when you add the word being before it, it helps you see more clearly in your translation that it's actually a participle, not a verb. If you didn't add being uh, to tempted in your translation, people might think that it's actually like an aorist indicative of peirazo, but it's not. It's a participle form and it's passive. So with passive voice participles, you're usually going to want to supply the word being with your translation. So we've seen so far the inflected forms for the present active, middle and passive participles. Now let's look at future tense forms, starting with the active voice here. Again, using our lexical form luo uh, as our root word. And you'll notice here, this is the present active participle forms of luo. You've got masculine, feminine, and neuter again. You've got all the cases represented. You've got singular and plural, as there's two columns under each gender. And again, this is very similar to what we just saw for the present active participle forms of luo. The only difference is that now there's going to be the addition of the future uh, tense marker that you've already learned for future indicative verbs, namely the sigma. And here the color contrast makes this very apparent when you have the stem highlighted in light blue for lu, and then you've got the future marker there or morpheme or sign, some people call it any of those terms with sigma in red. And then you've simply got the rest of the uh, portion of the word own, antas, anti, anta, antes, anton, etc., which you already know from the present active forms as well as from the amy forms. And so there's nothing really new to learn here. You're just simply um, adding one letter, in essence, to the present active forms. You're adding the sigma. And so there's not a ton of memorization with these participles. It's just noting the differences among words and um, being able to identify from those differences that this is a future tense form. And here's an example of how you would translate a present tense participle. Um, here we have 1 Peter 3.13. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? The phrase, um, he who will harm comes from the verb form kakao, which means harm or do bad, I do bad in its present tense form, or I do harm. And here it's put in the uh, future participle form. Kakoson is the nominative masculine singular form. We know it's nominative masculine singular because of the own case ending there highlighted in yellow. And it's future tense, active voice. And it's future, we know, because of the red sigma, of course, but it would have a sigma, and that's how you know it's future participle form. So how would you translate this? Well, because it's future tense, you would just simply add the word will, or in Old English, shall. But uh, here you would just say, it's he who uh, will harm you. Now, the definite article, ha, in front of um, kakoson tells you that this is being used um, adjectivally. In fact, it's a substantival use, as we'll see, of the participle. The one who or he who will harm. And future tense, you would just add the word will. And just to fill out our paradigms here, here's the future middle participle paradigm. And again, the only difference here is the addition of the sigma, you should already know from uh, present, middle, and passive participle forms of luo, 
that has the same spelling as the present middle and passive participles, except now here you've got the addition of sigma. And here I've just highlighted it in red in order for you to see this difference. And this brings us to the future passive voice forms for the participle of luo, which you can see here in this paradigm. And our words are getting fairly long because now we have the addition of two new letters into this passive form. And these letters are theta, eta, that combination, which you should recognize already um, because theta, eta was also used for future passive indicative verb forms as well as first aorist passive indicative verb forms. So when you see that theta, eta combination inside of a word, uh, infixed, so to speak, you will notice that um, that indicates a passive voice, whether it's uh, inside a, a participle like this here or inside of an indicative mood verb, as we saw with the future passive and first aorist passive. So that's it for this lesson as far as learning uh, paradigms or new forms of participles. Let me just mention a couple of things about future participles in particular. And the first is that the only difference again to keep in mind between the present and future participles as we've learned both forms is the addition of that uh, sigma inside of the word in the active and middle voice forms for the future and then the addition of the theta eta combination for the passive voice and then just to mention as well that the future participle forms are quite rare in the new testament so out of the 6,662 participles in the entire Greek New Testament, there are only 13 future tense occurrences. That's a very low percentage. About one-fifth of one percent of the time, you'll encounter a future tense participle in the New Testament. Very rare. In fact, even the pluperfect tense form for uh, verbs is quite rare. There's only 86 of those in the New Testament future forms of the participle are even more rare than that. So it's good to know uh, how the future participles are formed in contrast to the present participle, uh, just to note that, but it's, uh, it's not very critical because you're rarely going to encounter them. And all of this brings us to the very important subject now of usage and the wherefore in terms of our interpretation and exegesis how should we look at participles generally? Well, I gave you on your uh, website for our Moodle lesson uh, a breakdown in terms of two broad types of participles. Um, though it is true that participles can be used as verbs, that's a rare instance, um, I've simplified things on a chart uh, for you on the website and you can download that uh, PDF that has the breakdown of adjectival participles versus adverbial participles. Those are our two main broad categories. And the way that you distinguish between an adjectival participle and an adverbial participle is you should note, first of all, whether it's articular or anarthrous. Adverbial participles, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, they are always anarthrous. In other words, they don't have an article in front of the participle. If it's absent an article in front of the participle, then uh, you know that it's often going to be adverbial. In fact, adverbial participles have to be anarthrous. But when it comes to adjectival participles, which we'll look at first because they're a little easier to deal with, they are normally articular. They normally have that uh, definite article in front of them. And as you break this down even further, when you think of adjectival participles, there are essentially uh, two different types, the attributive type and the substantival type. Um, think back to our chapter or lesson on the subject of adjectives in uh, Greek grammar one, first semester grammar. You will recall that the um, adjectives can be used in a substantive position, they can be used in the predicate position, they can be used with an attributive position. And so that's in essence what we're dealing with here because you've got the participle functioning like an adjective in this instance. So it can be attributive and when that's the case it is uh, modifying another word, another noun, 
um, pronoun, etc. And in that case, you're often going to want to supply in your translation with the participle the words who or which or that. And then as we'll see, you can also, um, participles that are adjectival can also function as substantives. They can be a title or a noun or a pronoun by themselves. And you would translate those as he who or she who or the one who uh, or the, the blank one, the believing one or the overcoming one, that sort of thing. So let's look at some examples now to illustrate this. And I think it'll be clearer as we look at these. And here we have an example of the adjectival use of the participle that is functioning attributively rather than substantively. It's 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, which says, For God, who said, Light will shine out of darkness. Ek scatus fos lampse, uh, will shine. Out of darkness, light will shine. And here, notice at the beginning of this verse, it says, Ha theos, ha epon. Of course, theos is God, and it's preceded by the article. But then also preceding the participle here, a pon, is an article as well. And so what you have, if you recall from our chapter or lesson on adjectives, is you have the attributive position here of an adjective. And so the participle is functioning just like an adjective in that respect. And so it would be the attributive use of an adjectival participle. And how do we know that this is... Um, an, ad, an adjectival participle in particular? Well, because it's not adverbial. Remember, adverbial participles are anarthrous. They do not have articles preceding the participle. And here, very clearly, we have ha epon. You have an article preceding the participle. So it has to be adjectival. And then the next question is, what kind of adjectival participle is it? Attributive or substantive? And it's going to be functioning here uh, as in the attributive sense, because again, you've got ha theos and ha epon. The participle tells us something more about God. And so you would translate this for God who said, and so you would supply in your translation the word who here. Remember with adjectival participles that are attributive, you'll often want to supply in your translation who or which or that. And here's another example of an adjectival participle that is the attributive use of that participle. It's Matthew 16, 16, where Peter is saying to Jesus, uh, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the God, the living. In other words, the living God. And clearly, God here, theos, is being modified again by a second uh, genitive phrase, to zontas. And so, to theu, to zontas. Uh, just like to theu is masculine, singular, it's in the genitive case form, uh, because zontas is functioning adjectively here, or it's modifying the Theu, um, it also is in the same uh, gender, it's in the same uh, case form, and it is singular as well. So zontas is the participle form, uh, present active participle form of zao, uh, I live, is that verb form, but here it's in the genitive case, masculine gender, and it's singular in order to modify to theu. So those are two examples of participles that are adjectival. They both are preceded by articles, and so therefore they're not adverbial participles, and they're functioning attributively rather than substantively. Now in Matthew 7, verse 21, we have an example of uh, the adjectival participle again, but instead of being used attributively, here it's used substantively. In other words, it's used like a subject, in essence, um, like a title uh, or a noun. And you'll see two participles here in this sentence. Uh, they're both present participles. 
uh, both masculine. You know that not only by the case ending, legon and poion, but also by the article preceding each. And so how do you know that this is an adjectival participle as opposed to adverbial? Well, adverbial participles are always anarthrous. Here you're, you see two articles preceding the participle. It has to be adjectival. Well, what kind of adjectival participles are these? Well, again, they're, they're functioning not as um, attributive modifying another noun, but rather they're functioning almost like a noun or a subject all on their own. So in the sentence when it says, u pas, not everyone, ha legon, moi, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, kurii, kurii, es el usatai, there is your main verb, from Acerkamai, and it's a future tense verb. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of the heavens, literally. But the one doing the will of God, the will of the Father, of my Father, uh, who is in the heavens, literally. So you've got these two uh, participles here, um, halegon who says, and ha poion, who, he who does, and they're both functioning here substantively. Now notice with um, substantival participles, you're often going to want to supply the phrase who, he who, or she who, or the one who, etc. So there's an example of a substantival participle. Here's another example of the substantival use of an adjectival participle, Mark 14, verse 24. And it's in the context of the Lord instituting the Last uh, Supper, or the, the Lord's Supper, rather. And in this verse it says, And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Which is shed is the phrase uh, ta Akun amenon, and the uh, participle here is a present passive participle, nominative sing neuter singular. Um, but notice is shed. It's in reference to the blood of Jesus Christ or his work on the cross when he shed his blood to pay for our sins. Now, one thing I want to point out about this phrase that's significant is it's functioning substantively again. You've got the article in front of the participle. Um, but it's present tense. And oftentimes you will hear people say, well, because it's a present participle, therefore it refers to ongoing action. Like um, when it comes to believing in Jesus Christ, if you have genuine faith, your faith must persevere or endure to the end to be truly eternally saved. Uh, so therefore a present participle indicates this sort of persevering, saving faith. Well, that's reading far too much into the uh, tense form of the participle, because oftentimes these present tense forms refer to an action that occurs once, as Jesus Christ once shed his blood for our sins. Now let's apply this to a couple of key verses when it comes to the subject of believing and overcoming. You all know John 3.16, probably the most popular verse from the entire Bible or most well-known. And did you know, however, that it contains a present uh, substantival participle um, in the phrase ha pistuon, he who believes, or whoever believes is usually how it's translated. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he who believes or whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, life eternal. But ha pistuon is our present uh, participle here. It's present tense. And you'll notice uh, that it's articular again. It has the article preceding the participle, which tells us it's not adverbial usage. It's uh, adjectival. And what kind of adjectival? It's either attributive or substantival, and it's substantival here because it's functioning like a noun in itself, the believing one, or he who believes is how it could be translated, 
or whoever believes is sometimes how it's translated. But again, the question is here, with the present participle form, does this necessarily require that you have ongoing faith in order to be eternally saved? And I have had people tell me this over and over again through the years, that yes, it's true, all you have to do is believe in Christ, but they'll say, your faith better endure to the end and you better hold on to Jesus or else he's not gonna hold on to you to the end. And they deny the true biblical teaching of eternal security as a result. I've had both Calvinists and Lordship Salvationists present this argument, as well as Arminians who believe you can lose your salvation. And it's based on a misunderstanding again of the present articular participle form here, where pistuon is just simply referring to a person who does something. They may do that thing one time, like Jesus shedding his blood on the cross, or they may do it over and over and over again. While it's true the Lord wants us to walk by faith in our Christian life, it is also true that if somebody believes in him, transfers their trust from their works to Christ alone one time, they have eternal life and they are constituted as the believing one, the hapistuon here. And so that's the significance of the uh, grammar here of this passage. Let's look at another instance of the uh, substantival use of an adjectival participle, this time when it comes to the overcomer that we see uh, mentioned seven times in Revelation chapters two and three. Who are the overcomers? Are they uh, super Christians or are they just simply one who uh, is a believer in Jesus Christ, who is overcome by faith? Uh, even if practically they do not overcome sin, Satan, and the world in their everyday walk, in sanctification. I think it's the latter. The, the phrase, the one who overcomes, refers to all believers because positionally we're in the one who overcame on our behalf. Now it is true he wants us to practically overcome sin, Satan, and the world. And as we walk by faith and we're enabled by the Spirit of God and, and sanctified by his grace, that's true. But I don't believe that's what the phrase, he who overcomes, means in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, as some people interpret that. So here again, we have the same grammatical structure or phrase as we saw with uh, the one who sheds his blood or the one who believes, John 3, 16. Here it's ha nikon. Um, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And there we see one of our vocabulary words, hey, adakia, um, is used here uh, for the idea of hurt. Actually, it's in the verb form here, uh, adakeo, which is very common throughout Revelation for hurt or harm, but it's related um, to that word for unrighteousness that we saw, adakia, in 1 John 1, 9. I'm digressing. Let's get back to our point here. The point is with ha nikon, that's that construction. We know that it's an adjectival use again of the participle nikon from nikao, meaning I overcome. It's a participle here because of the ending to it, uh, nikon, and it's preceded by the article. So this can't be an adverbial participle. Rather, it's adjectival, and in this instance, it's functioning substantively. It tells us the one who overcomes, or he who overcomes. There's your noun phrase, in essence, your subject for the sentence. That individual will not be hurt by the second death. Now, because it's a present tense uh, participle, it's not telling us necessarily that this person continually overcomes, as though they have a pattern or a habit in their life of practically overcoming sin, Satan, and the world, etc. And so just to clarify that when you see that present participle, don't automatically think of ongoing action. Now it's true in terms of aspect, you are in the action, you're on the curbside, you see it up close, so to speak, it's proximate, it's imperfective aspect because you're seeing the act in progress, but that doesn't mean that the act is continuous, repetitive, enduring, that sort of thing. It could be a one-time act. And I, I believe that 
All it takes to become an overcomer is simply to put your faith in Jesus Christ and positionally you're in him, the overcoming one, and you belong to him forever as an overcomer. 1 John 5, 4 and 5 support that, as well as Romans chapter 8 and other passages. And so again, just to review, that when you see a participle, the first question you should uh, ask yourself or observe in the sentence is, is it preceded by an article? Remember, adverbial participles are always anarthrous. They cannot have a definite article. So if it has the article, it's going to be adjectival. And then you need to ask yourself, well, what kind of adjectival participle, attributive or substantive? That's what we've just seen. Now let's move on to adverbial participles, which are a little more complex. And here is the contrast with adjectival participles which is what we saw in the previous examples. Now we have the adverbial participle. And again, the first thing I want you to see in parentheses underneath the adverbial participle is that it's always anarthrous. And again, I've got this sheet for you contrasting these two uh, forms or types of participles, adjectival, adverbial, on the Moodle site for you to download. And I would encourage you to have that at the ready when you do your lesson, have it on hand for uh, consulting and, and referencing. And here, though, I have it broken down between temporal and causal participles uh, as part of the adverbial uh, category. Don't think that there are only two types of adverbial participles. In fact, I put an asterisk by the phrase usage because uh, in the footnote that you'll see in the broader handout that you can download from the website, uh, that there are actually eight or nine different categories of usage for the adverbial participle. I just put two up here because they're quite common. And to give you a couple of examples to see um, at a glance in terms of a, a chart for comparison's sake. Temporal and causal are just two types of adverbial participles. There's actually eight or nine, as I mentioned. There are participles of, of means, of manner, of cause or causal, uh, of condition, of concession, of purpose, of result, uh, temporal or time. And then there's some debate as to whether attendant circumstance is also truly a category of adverbial participle, uh, but I included that just for uh, fullness sake. So you can reference all those on, again, the Moodle site. So just for the sake of review, let's consider a few key points here about participles. First of all, when you see a participle with an article, it's articular, it will always be an adjectival participle. Why is that? Because adverbial participles cannot have the article in front of them. They're always an arthrus. So when you see a participle without an article, anarthrous, I say it is normally an adverbial participle because sometimes adjectival participles can be anarthrous too. It's just that you cannot have an adverbial participle with an article. And that's the third point here, the key point. In other words, only adjectival participles have articles, but adjectival participles do not always occur with an article. So in terms of the, the first key point when it comes to interpreting participles, the article is the key. In fact, many times you will see in grammar books or in other resources, a flow chart for how to interpret participles. And it's almost humorous how elaborate they can be. Uh, the flow chart is sometimes actually more complicated than it needs to be. I've tried to simplify this for you on that abbreviated handout of two broad types of uh, participles. But this is the key, first of all, look for the article or the absence of the article. Now let's go back to adjectival participles for a moment because I want to clarify a further point about them and how to translate or interpret them. And that involves the issue of cases. So when an adjectival participle modifies a noun, that means they are functioning like an adjective. 
So in that case, they will almost always agree with that noun in case, gender, and number. And I say almost always because I've stated in the past that they must agree in case, gender, and number. And then I remember somebody presenting me with one of the few <laughs> exceptions in the New Testament where that's not true. Uh, that happened a couple of years ago in a previous class. Uh, so I say almost always, it's, it's virtually a rule that there must be this case, gender, and number agreement, just as you would expect with adjectives, um, but not always. And going back to an example we've seen already from Matthew 16, 16, where Peter says in his confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, that phrase to zontas there, the um, participle phrase, you clearly adjectival because you get the article again to in front of zontas. But notice again that there's case agreement, uh, whether it's to theu, the word being modified God, in the genitive case here, the participle is in the genitive case as well, zontas. There's also number agreement. In both cases, it's singular. And there's also gender agreement. In both cases, it's masculine. So you've got case, gender, and number agreement when the adjective is being used, or the participle is being used here adjectivally. Another point to keep in mind when it comes to interpreting or translating adjectival participles is when you see a participle in one of the oblique cases, it is almost always an adjectival participle. Here's another tip or clue for you um, that I'm providing to help you uh, readily, quickly, easily interpret or translate some of these participles. What are the oblique cases? Well, they're the cases that are not nominative or vocative. So in other words, genitive, dative, accusative in the five case system. So when you see those, you can say in your mind, well, it's virtually always going to be an adjectival participle. And here's one example of this in Matthew 2, verse 7, where it says, Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared, is how it's translated in the New King James Version of the English translation. But when you see that uh, phrase there, what time the star appeared, it almost sounds like from the English translation that we're dealing with uh, the word appeared as uh, an aorist, infinite, or aorist indicative verb, rather, but it's actually a participle here. And the participle is uh, the participle form of phino, to shine, or to appear, to be made manifest, that sort of thing. And so uh, what you've got here is a case where it's the uh, participle for fino is in the present tense. It's middle and passive voice, but it's genitive case, masculine singular. And the same is true when it comes to the star asteros. It's a uh, genitive case, masculine singular. So you've got the participle in the same case, gender, and number modifying star here and more literally you could translate it as uh, the shining star so the the phrase shining fine amenu uh, literally is modifying like an adjective the word star even though you don't see that in the english translation it would be very difficult or awkward to translate it as such into english and so they just basically make it sound like a verb phrase, uh, the star appeared. But in the Greek, it's actually an ad adjectival um, participle functioning attributively like an adjective. Now here in Matthew 5, verse 44, we have another example of an adjectival participle. It is uh, a participle that occurs in one of those oblique cases again. In this case, it's in the genitive case. And the sentence says, and pray for those who persecute you. Uh, Prosukamai is the, is the word for um, pray. And persecute there is uh, epi readzo. And it's in the participle form. It's a present active participle, but it's genitive, genitive masculine plural. 
those who persecute you. <clears throat> and because it's genitive, it's one of the oblique cases again. And that means that it is adjectival rather than adverbial. And so it's functioning grammatically here in this case as the object of a prepositional phrase. But as a participle, it is first of all adjectival, but it's also functioning here, uh, those who persecute you, it's functioning substantively rather than as uh, an adjective per se, attributively, uh, as an attributive adjective. <clears throat> Just another note to keep in mind when it comes to adjectival participles, they occur in the nominative case when they modify another nominative case word, usually a noun, pronoun, um, adjective, etc. Or they take the place, or they occur in the nominative case when they take the place of a nominative case noun, either as the subject, like we've seen with substantival use, or a predicate nominative. Here is an instance of the nominative case form of a participle that's being used attributively. In John 6, verse 50, <clears throat> it says, Hutas esten ha artas, um, this is the bread, ha ek tu uranu, uh, which from the heaven, katabainon, comes down. And so here you have the uh, participle katabainon, and it's in the nominative case form, and it's modifying the word uh, bread in this instance. It tells us what kind of bread or artas it is. And so here it's modifying another noun, and it's also in the, since that noun is in the nominative case, the modifying participle is going to be in the nominative case as well. Now let's switch from adjectival to adverbial participles and also continue with the subject of cases and how they function with their case forms. You should note that adverbial participles almost always occur in the nominative case. This is because adverbial participles assume the same subject or actor as the main verb in a sentence or independent clause, so they must be of the same case as the actor or subject in that sentence or clause. Here's an example from Matthew 5 verse, excuse me, Matthew 3 verse 1. In Matthew 3 1, the sentence says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the desert or wilderness of Judea, and I've left off of Judea, but it says here that the verb is um, paraginatai, that's the present indicative third person singular um, for he came, referring to John coming, but how did he come? In what manner did he come? He came preaching, you see Caruso there in its participle form. And so this is an instance where we have an adverbial participle of manner. Again, very common use of the adverbial participle. You'll notice that it's not preceded by an article. Uh, that's one instance uh, which tells you if it had an article in front of it, it could not be adverbial, but here it is. In fact, notice the phrase before it, John, ha, Ioannes, Ha baptistes, John the baptizer, the one who does baptizing. So that was characteristic of John. In fact, he's called John the Baptist uh, later, even after he's beheaded. And obviously he wasn't continuing to baptize at that point. So that just shows you that ha baptistes, um, that type of phrase does not refer to ongoing activity necessarily. Uh, but can be used simply as a title or uh, for the subject and that sort of thing. I'm digressing again. Let's go back to Kerusone here for a moment. This again describes the manner in which John came. Um, so it's working together with Paraginatai for he came. And notice though that Ioannes ha baptistes is all nominative. Um, 
the article is nominative case, Baptistes is nominative case, in fact, even Ioannes, um, nominative case form. So, K. Russo, being the participle here that tells us more about how John came, adopts the same case as the person who is the subject or the actor doing the coming. So it's nominative case, and it's also singular. That's another clue. Now, even though participles in Greek don't have person, first, second, third person, they do have number, and you're going to find that the subject or actor who's doing the action of the participle um, in number, singular or plural, is going to line up with the uh, action of the main verb, in this case, paragenitai. But here they have the same case. Now there's one last subject I'd like to address in this lesson with participles uh, before we uh, conclude, and that is the subject of time. The time of the action of the participle is a, 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 a tricky issue, and I'm going to teach you, first of all, the traditional understanding of how to view the time of the participle's action. And then, in a future lesson, probably the next lesson, I'm going to go into greater detail about how to view time in general with verbs and participles. But for the conclusion of this lesson, let me just mention a few things about time. The traditional rule of thumb for a participle's time of action has been this, that the time of the participle's action is relative to the action of the main verb in the sentence. So for instance, when you see a participle in a sentence, look for the main verb that it's working with. Like in the previous example from Matthew 3.1 that we saw, we saw that keruson was working with paraginetai. And so that's how you're going to uh, need to look at a participle. You find the participle, you ask, is it an articular or an arthrus? And from there, you look for the main verb in the sentence. Now, this is the traditional understanding. If the main verb in the sentence is a present tense form, present indicative, let's say, then if you've got a present participle, that means that the participle's action is going to be simultaneous with that present tense uh, indicative verb form, which means that you're going to translate both the participle and the um, indicative mood verb as present tense normally, unless it's a what's called a historical present, like we saw in Matthew 3.1, the previous example, and then it's all put in the past tense, but a Greek reader would read that and see the present tense and present tense, and it would pop out at him as being very vivid, and he would know, well, this is a historical present, even though it's a past tense context. But again, when you see a, a present tense participle, if the action of the main verb is also present indicative, this traditional interpretation would say that you translate both as present time actions. So in other words, the participle's action is going to be simultaneous with the present tense action. Now, it gets a little more complicated than that. Let's say you've got a present tense participle <clears throat> with an aorist tense main verb. In that case, <clears throat> excuse me, the timing of the present participle is going to be simultaneous with an aorist indicative past time main verb. So the participle that's present tense is going to be at the same time as the past tense main verb, and you're going to translate both as past tense. Now, the traditional understanding says when you see an aorist tense participle, that the action of that participle precedes the action of the main verb. So let's say you've got a present tense main verb in a sentence, but you've got an aorist tense participle. So the action of the participle is going to be understood as past in time, preceding the time that the main verb, verb's action is taking place. And then when it comes to future tense participles, these are to be understood 
as subsequent to the action of the main verb. So you can see why as you look at these um, three uh, uh, general types of participles here, simultaneous, preceding, and subsequent, how everything is relative to the timing of that main verb in the sentence. Now I want to read to you this statement from a more modern textbook that incorporates verbal aspect and I think gets it more accurate. When it comes to the time of participles, Merkel and Plummer say this, the time of the action is not determined by the participle. It's not inherent within the participle is what they're saying. Simply by looking at the participle tense form, it doesn't mean, let's say if it's a present participle, that it's gonna be present action. You can't assume time of action just by looking at its tense form. So the time of the action is not determined by the participle, but by the broader context. Indicative verbs nearby provide some of the most significant context, and as an initial attempt at contextual translation, you should translate a present tense form participle in the same time frame as indicative verbs that are close at hand. To clarify, a present participle does not necessarily communicate that the participle's action is contemporaneous with the writer's time of writing. Rather, the action is likely in progress, i.e. imperfective aspect, on the curbside looking at internal action, is what he's saying, they're saying here. Rather, the action is likely in progress when the action of the main verb in the sentence occurs, a past, present, or future. Now, all of that is a mouthful, but it's in essence saying this. When you see a, a tense form for a participle, let's say it's present tense form participle, don't assume that it's present time action. That is contingent. The time of the participle's action is relative or dependent upon the larger context. Traditionally, students have been taught, look for the time of the action of the main verb in the sentence. And that's true, you need to look for that. But you also need to look at broader time indicators in the overall context, not just the uh, tense form of the indicative mood main verb in the sentence. So that's what Plummer and Merkel are driving at here. To look at uh, the timing of the participle's action a little more broadly than just that main verb in the sentence. Now let's look at a couple of examples from the New Testament that hopefully will clarify this uh, oftentimes very confusing subject for uh, especially first time students encountering Greek participles. Here we have an example from John 6 verse 59 that says of Jesus, this is in the Bread of Life Discourse chapter, uh, John 6, these things he, that would be Jesus, said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Now, a couple things to note here, highlighted in yellow. He taught, didaskon, is actually a present participle from didasko. It's, in this case, present active participle, nominative, masculine, singular, from didasko. So if it's a present tense participle, why is it translated as past tense, or to be interpreted or understood that way? Well, because again, the time of the participle's action is relative to the broader context, at least to the um, indicative mood verb, main verb in this sentence, which would be in this case, apen. Apen here is the aorist active indicative form of lego, I, I speak or say. So these things he said, Jesus said, past tense, and we know it's past tense from the larger context, not just the aorist indicative of Lego here. But when you combine didaskon with apen, didaskon being present tense participle, the timing of this action is affected by the aorist indicative here of the context when he spoke. And so that's why didaskon is translated here as past tense. I don't believe this is an instance here of the historical present. It's just an instance where you have um, a present tense participle whose action is simultaneous with 
the action of the sentence, uh, the main verb in the sentence, he said. So that's why we have this example here of, of didaskon being translated as past tense. Now let's just use one more example here in closing to illustrate the relative time of the action of a participle. In the historical context of Acts chapter 13, the Apostle Paul has just finished preaching the gospel of Christ's finished work, is being accursed for us on the tree, uh, showing substitution, his resurrection from the dead, and how justification is by faith in Jesus Christ apart from works of the law. So he's taught the message of the gospel of grace and the finished work of Christ. And the Gentiles love what he had to say. The Jews in large part rejected it. So it says in verse 48, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. The words for rejoicing and glorifying, ekeron and edoxadzen, are both imperfect active indicative verbs. 95% of the time in the New Testament, imperfect tense, uh, imperative, excuse me, indicative mood um, occurs in context of past time, like it does here. And of course, the historical context, larger context of chapter 13 indicates this is past time as well, as, as Luke is writing retrospectively. But notice here that akuanta, the participle, is present tense participle from akuo, it's present active, nominative, neuter, plural. Now it's plural because the subject is plural, ta ethne, the Gentiles. So in this case, the ones doing the hearing, the Gentiles, the participle is going to match the number of the subject in the sentence. But notice it's present tense, whereas glorifying and rejoicing the other two verbs are imperfect tense, indicative. So what is the time of the action of akuanta? Well, it's present tense, so that means it's simultaneous with the action of the two other main verbs in this sentence and in the larger context. So that means the present tense participle here is going to be viewed um, or translated as past tense, and that's why it's translated, and when the Gentiles heard this, it's not translated, and when the Gentiles hear this, which wouldn't make much sense in English um, if the rest of the sentence is past tense. So this is another illustration of, again, relative time of action for the participles. Now, I know all of this can be very confusing, especially to a student who's encountering Greek participles for the very first time. But hopefully, because you've been trained now to think of verbs in 3D with aspect, time, and action sort, uh, you can look at participles in the same way and realize there's far more to it than just time of action. And you need to take context into consideration each time you do the translation exercises. I think as you do your assignments and you get more experience working with participles, you'll come to understand um, more clearly. You won't feel like you're in a fog. Uh, just how these participles really function. And so that's it. Next time we'll expand on this idea of time of action with participles.